We're going to look at uh, John chapter 18 today. Um, We've been progressing through the Gospel of John over the last two years. If you don't know, next Sunday will be the new location, but it's also our second anniversary Sunday as a church plan, as Peak Bible Church. Um, So it's been great. Uh, The Lord has been gracious to us. Um, But we've been working through these, these two years through the book of John, and we just spent several weeks on the Lord's Prayer in John chapter 17. Now we're going into John 18, and this begins uh, what is essentially the, the final journey um, of Christ, the final uh, trek that our Savior will make. And, and we're going to see some things in today's passage that show us what kind of man he was. Uh, our, our Savior was a great man. He was a courageous man. Uh, I will say ahead of time, sometimes as a pastor, as a preacher, uh, you, you look at a text and, and you're working through it, and, and you see someone's outline, and it's better than what you can do. So this is Dr. MacArthur's outline today. I don't do this often. Most of the time you get my outline, uh, but it's his. I didn't even read much of the commentary because I didn't want to copy his sermon, uh, but the outline, the way he divided it, is from Dr. MacArthur. So if you go on, uh, you open up your MacArthur commentary, and you say, that's exactly what Ryan did, I know, uh, and I'm giving him credit. Um, he did better than I could do this week. He does better than I can do probably every week, but um, uh, I'm, I'm embracing that better today. But we're going to think about the, the, the words of Christ as he heads towards his death. Um, the, the last words of Christ were on the cross, and he says, it is finished. Uh, but he's finished his time in the upper room with the disciples, They've left. We just finished the Lord's Prayer in John, in John 17. And now he's walking to the Garden of Gethsemane. And he says some really impactful stuff in one statement in particular in the Garden. But as we consider the last words of, of great men, there's been a lot of great men throughout history. And their last words often sum up their life if they have the opportunity to give last words. Uh, if you've been to Glenwood Springs, you can walk up to where they believe Doc Holliday is buried. And, and Doc Holliday was a, a real life, not just from the movie Tombstone, but a real life gunfighter. Uh, he was quite talented at it, and he always thought he would die fighting. But tuberculosis took Doc Holliday, and he died in a hospital bed, and he's a good cowboy. And so he always said, I'm going to die with my boots on. And he looks down at the end of the bed and looks at his feet that are bare, and he says, this is funny, and he dies because he didn't get to die with his boots on as he wished. Groucho Marx, the famous comedian, in the moments before he died, he said, this is no way to live. (laughs) George Patton, incredible, I'm going to have to uh, cushion this one some, Uh, the incredible uh, general and leader of allied forces died in a hospital after a car accident. He always thought he'd die in battle. He got in a car accident, spent 12 days in traction in the hospital for his spine, and when he died, he said, this is a heck of a way to die. G.K. Chesterton is a famous author and thinker that drew, is very helpful. You should read his books. Uh, He drew clear lines between good and evil his entire life. When he died, he said, the issue is now clear. It is between light and darkness, and everyone must choose his side. These words all kind of sum up the way these men lived. Now, for Jesus today, in John 18, we're going to see whether or not his definitive last words, but close to it. And and this is the most succinct account of what happened in the garden in the Bible. Every gospel contains the garden, the story in the garden, uh, where Jesus is ultimately betrayed by Judas. And uh, this is, the again, the most concise one. Um, But we're going to look at uh, John chapter 18, verses 1 through 11 today, and we'll borrow some from these other narratives. Uh, But if you're able, I'd ask you now, please stand out of reverence for the reading of the Word of God. John chapter 18, beginning in verse 1, says, When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron, where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. 
Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. He asked them again, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. Of those whom you gave me, I have, not, I have lost not one. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup? that the Father has given me. Please be seated. Father, we ask that you would bless us as we work through this account today. Uh, Lord, we can learn much from our Savior. Help us in Jesus' name. Amen. So today, throughout this narrative, the story of Jesus in the garden, we are going to see the courage of Christ, the power of Christ, the love of Christ, and the obedience of Christ. In verses 1 through 4, we see Jesus going out in the garden with his disciples. And, and in this, we're going to see the courage of Christ displayed. We've got to think about the circumstance. Jesus has been in the upper room. He's with his disciples. He knows for sure what's coming. This has been ordained before the foundations of the world that this would happen. He knows what's going to be there. And he walks to the garden. And this is an intentional thing. I, I was in Israel in October. And, and the upper room is a long way from the garden. You have to walk through the city. You have to walk across the entire temple complex in front of the temple. Outside the wall, there were shops and markets through there. He would have had to walk through these markets, out in front of the temple, across this brook, the, the, through the Valley Kidron, and then up into the Garden of Gethsemane. And it's still there today. Now, there is no hope of any kind of uh, contemplative or prayerful time at the garden today. There's too many people. But it, it stands. It's, it's still available. You can go walk around it. They don't let you walk through it anymore. In fact, the trees that, have, that are there, the olive trees, they've been cut down, but an olive tree will grow from the same root. And so the same trees that were there in Christ's day, they know are there today and some of them have growth that's over 400 years old, uh, standing in the Garden of Gethsemane right now. This isn't a large place, but in Jesus' day, it was certainly a, a quiet place. And, and this is a place that Jesus went routinely, according to the account in Luke chapter 2, verse 39. So Judas knew that Jesus liked to go there. And, and Jesus could have, when he was up in, in the upper room with the disciples, could have just gone somewhere else, right? It, it's not like he didn't know what was going to happen. He knew what the end was, and, and he went anyway. Our Savior knew what was ahead, and yet Hebrews 12, 2 says that for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. He despised the shame. He knew what was coming, and he went anyway. And, and there was no mystery here in Jesus' mind. This is what he was certain of in all of eternity past. Mark 14, 36, we see that Jesus asked that if possible, that the cup would pass from him. He asked for a way out. But if we look at Mark chapter 14 and verse 41, we see that Jesus has his answer from the Father. Verse 36, he says, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. He goes back to the disciples. He finds them sleeping. And in verse 41, And he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Jesus walked into the crucifixion. And he walked into the crucifixion willingly. Tomorrow we celebrate Memorial Day. And many men and women have selflessly given their lives for this country. 
in June of 1944, there's a guy named Private Joe Gandara. Probably not pronouncing the name right, but Joe Gandara. And Joe was a part of a, a detachment in Germany. And his force became overwhelmed by some German forces. They were pinned down. There were uh, machine gun placements. It wasn't an easy place to be. And his entire force was hiding for four hours as the Germans fired on him. And then Joe, a private, he's not a high-ranking individual, but he's a young man of great bravery, got up and voluntarily and alone advanced on the German position. And he took out three of the machine gun placements before he was killed. And his unit survived because of what Joe did. It's astounding bravery. And as a private, Joe's probably 18, 19. And he gets up and he goes and does the work that needs to be done to save others. He was posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor by President Obama in 2014. But there's thousands and thousands of men like this. And we appreciate them. And we're thankful for them. And they show great courage. Christ has shown the greatest courage that we can fathom. We cannot comprehend what our Lord went through in those moments on the cross, and yet he faced it anyway. He could have gone somewhere else. He could have done something else. He could have chosen to leave us in our sins and not died for us. He could have eradicated the men that came to take him. But he went to the cross anyway. It's not like he didn't know the physical pain he was going to endure on the cross. He knew nails were coming. He knew there would be a crown of thorns. He knew there would be whipping and beating. Jesus knew that he would face separation from the Father. He'd always had a perfect relationship with God, the Father, for all of history, before history. So then we can never fathom that those moments that you felt closest to Jesus, those moments, if you're here today and you're a Christian, that you have drawn closest to your Savior, the joy and rapture you felt in that moment, Jesus never knew anything but that. And then it was broken. Jesus knew the physical punishment that was coming. He knew the separation that was coming. coming, And he knew the absolute dreadful, terrifying wrath of God that would be poured out on him. In that one moment, Jesus endured immense wrath. We, we can't understand what happened there. But you and I would go to hell if it were not for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And for all of eternity, there would be darkness and weeping and gnashing of teeth, and we'd be consumed by worms that never die, and we would burn forever and ever and ever in hell. If you don't know Jesus, that's what awaits you. But for his people, for his children, Jesus endured all of that for all of those people. All of that eternity, it was poured out on him in that one single moment, and yet he walked into the garden. The courage of Christ that we see here is astounding. It's amazing. He is the bravest man to have ever walked the face of the planet. And, and he's not a man that's 55, 60 years old that has loads of life behind him that, that can look ahead and say, well, better me than them. He's a man that's 33 years old. But he knows what he must do, that he glorify the Father. And that's why you say, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And he walks into the garden. Jesus went into the garden, and that's not the end of the courage that we see. Because not only could he have just gone somewhere else, but the immense power of Christ could have overthrown the men, those men in that moment. And that's the second thing we see in this passage, the courage of Christ and then the power of Christ. The end of verse 4, he says, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed them, betrayed him, was standing with them. 
When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Jesus says words and men fall. This is out of a Marvel movie. This doesn't happen in real life. I'm loud. I'm not George Whitfield, but I'm loud. My wife often tells me I'm yelling. I'm not, I'm not yelling. I can yell. It doesn't matter if I stood six inches from your face and with everything I have yelled in your face, you don't have to draw back and fall to the ground. But these men did. And we got to look here both at what Christ said and who these men were. There's, you know, some men representing the high priest, the servant Malchus, who gets his ear cut off. We'll see here in a minute. Right? There's some regular men. But there's also Roman soldiers. There's men that go with swords and torches and lanterns. These are men prepared for battle. Right? They're prepared to, to do something. This is a, a, a contingent of Roman men that are, that are headed for Christ. And Jesus is just standing there as a man with his 11 closest friends praying in a garden. But people have come with inordinate force throughout all of church history on men. Polycarp was 86 years old when he died. He was a disciple of John who wrote this book. And, and Polycarp could have fled, but he was 86 years old and he said, I'm, I'm done. And he let them come and take him. But it wasn't like a couple guys walked into this 86-year-old man when everyone else had already fled and then escorted him away. Roman soldiers came on horseback with swords drawn to take Polycarp. And Polycarp had great courage as well. He was faithful to the end. His famous last words are, for 86 years my Savior has been faithful to me. How could I betray him now? And he was delivered by fire into heaven. But this group of soldiers come to Jesus in the garden. They come in power, and, and they came with military might. And you would expect this to be just over. That They would walk in and grab him and, and walk away. But when Jesus says, I am he, they back to the ground, or they fall back to the ground. And, and the thing here is, the English doesn't do this well. Because Jesus didn't say, I am he. What Jesus said is, I am. This is not a statement you and I make, unless, you know, who's going to Pizza Hut? I am, right? That's it. We don't declare of self-existence, I am. But in Exodus 3.14, when Moses asked God who he can tell the people of Israel he has been sent by, the response was, say, I am has sent you. The self-existent one. Jesus says, I am. And when he speaks these words, these battle-hardened, weapon-at-the-ready Roman soldiers fall back to the ground. There's no evidence or thought here that Jesus screams this and some kind of comical wave knocks them over. The power is in the fact that Jesus is God. And he says, I am. These words would have had an immense impact for all the Jews that were present. And the Roman soldiers, these men that came to get him, all of them, threw them to the ground. Words fail us to describe the weight of this statement, I am. But we see the power that's evident in it. And we see here the courage of Christ extended through this. Because if he can say two words and knock these men to the ground, he can certainly overcome these men. 
The effect of those words come because of the power of who Jesus is. The power of Jesus is the power that healed disease and raised the dead. The, the power of Jesus is the power that calmed the sea and stopped the sun in the sky. The, Jesus calms the sea and they listen, the waves listen to him because they heard his voice when he made them. He's God of gods. He's the creator God of the universe. The one we spoke about this morning in Sunday school that is worship, worthy of worship and reverence. The power of Jesus is the power that created the heavens and the earth. The power of Jesus is the power that gave Israel the victory time and time again as they entered the promised land. He is God of gods. And if the words of Christ can create the sun, they can certainly set a, men, a group of men on their backs. Sometimes we think of Jesus as a, a victim in the crucifixion. We look at what happened and we say, how terrible. And it was a terrible thing. But it was an intentional thing. This lamb that went to the slaughter is also the king that comes back on, on a horse to avenge his people and to reclaim his kingdom. Jesus isn't a victim in the crucifixion. This is the means by which he conquers. The reason that he restrained his power here, because he stops. He says, I am. They draw back and fall to the ground. He asks them again in verse 7, whom do you seek? They say, Jesus of Nazareth. He answers again, I told you, I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. This is to, to fulfill the word that he had spoken of those whom you gave me. I have not lost one. Jesus withheld his power at this moment. He didn't just leave. He didn't just conquer the entire Roman Empire because of his love for the saints. We see the love of Christ exercised through the care specifically here of his disciples, but by extension to every one of us, that we would know the love of Christ through his death. He loved you enough to die for you. The assumed to be captors get up off the ground, and Jesus asks them again whom they're looking for, and he says, look, I'm here, guys. This is me. And I've told you that I'm here, so the rest of my disciples you need to let go. Now, when Jesus says, of those whom you have given me, I lost not one. This is uh, out of chapter 17, just in the um, high priestly prayer in verse 12. It says, while I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Jesus isn't talking about saving these men from the Roman soldiers. Jesus is talking about faith here. He's talking about them being maintained as children of God throughout all eternity. Jesus knew that he was on the eve of the greatest suffering that would ever take place in all of history. And his care is still on the disciples, but he knows that he's going to lose them physically. He's about to die. And, and then he knows he's going to be around until today, the day of Pentecost. And then Jesus goes to heaven. So he's not going to be with them forever. We're not talking a physical maintaining here. He's saying, I'm going to maintain them as one of ours. I'm going to maintain them as a child of God. And Jesus here evidently then knows that the disciples could be tempted to turn away if they were arrested. They could be tempted to flee. And this makes complete sense. Because they grab Jesus, and all the disciples run away. They grab Jesus, and the chief, the leader of the disciples, Peter himself, denies Christ not once, not twice, but three times, and that to a little girl. They act after Jesus is dead as though they don't anticipate the resurrection at all. They didn't pay attention to what he said. They didn't pay attention when he said, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. They wallowed in defeat. 
The women go to the tomb afterwards and, and they're weeping because surely someone has taken the body of Christ. When Jesus told them, I'm going to rise again, I'm going to come back. Luke twenty two forty 40 tells us that in this account, they don't even stay awake long enough to pray with Christ and to pray that, them, that they themselves would not enter into, te- into temptation. But Jesus does not lose any that are his. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 34, it says, Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Can the Roman guards separate us from the love of Christ? The answer is absolutely not, as it is written. For your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Jesus takes these disciples, these ones that will flee, though he has promised them the victory, and he makes them conquerors. Jesus takes you and I, that though we turn away at the slightest thing, we see something shiny and run towards it. We're the most fickle of God's creatures. We betray him day in and day out by violating his word, not trusting him with how he says we should live our lives. And yet he says, we are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ, through him who loved us. And he says, for I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the love of Christ that we see here, that out of everyone that would ever come to him, he never loses one. Not a single one. And if you are truly saved, you never have reason to fear that you can lose your salvation because it's not you that maintains it. It's your Father in heaven through his Spirit, by the power of his Son, through the love of his Son that maintains your salvation. It's Jesus Christ that has done the work. And we see the love of Christ come. Jesus is still concerned for our hearts in our deepest and darkest moments. Imagine the depth of darkness that the disciples felt here. They're they're losing their leader. He's gone. This is the final place. This is it. He's passed through crowds before, but he says the hour is at hand. And then the Roman soldiers show up. And Judas, that snake, the liar, the betrayer, is with them. And they know it's time. But Jesus says, I'm still not going to lose a single one of them. Christian, in your deepest, darkest moment, Jesus isn't going to lose you. Because you're not your own. You're his. You were bought with a price. You belong to him and he will maintain you. We've seen the, the courage of Christ, the power of Christ, the love of Christ And in verses 10 and 11, we see the obedience of Jesus Christ. Verse 10 says, Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? Jesus' power is unquestioned, but again, we see it exercised even here. He said, says later in uh, the chapter in verse 36, he tells Pilate, If my kingdom was of this world, I would have had my men raise up and fight. Do you know that those that celebrated his coming into the city would have fought with him? That's what they were waiting for. A Messiah to come that would overthrow the Romans. Jesus could have built an army like no other. But he says, my kingdom isn't of this world. He tells Peter, put your sword away. And in fact, in Luke twenty-two fifty-one, 51, tells us that Jesus heals the servant. He touches his ear and restores it. But Jesus' concern here isn't his freedom. It's not that his men would fight. It's not that he would escape again. His concern is the obedience that he renders to the Father. And he tells Peter to put that sword away for one specific reason. 
Put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? This isn't Jesus saying, this is my lot in life. That's not what these words mean. Jesus is referring to a very specific cup in Jeremiah chapter 25 in verses 15 through 17. Thus the Lord, the God of Israel, said to me, Take from my hand this cup of wine of wrath and make all the nations to whom I send you drink it. They shall drink and stagger and be crazed because of the sword that I am sending among them. So I took the cup from the Lord's hand and made all the nations to whom the Lord sent me drink it. The cup that Jesus takes from the Father is the cup of wrath. Even in the, this narrative, in, in the Lord's Prayer, when he's, or the, sorry, in the garden, when he says, if it be your will, Father, let this cup pass from me. Let this wrath pass from me. That's what Jesus drinks. It's a cup of wrath for the children of God, and he drinks it to the dregs. The very bottom of the cup, he consumes all of the wrath for you and I. There's not one drop of wrath left for you, Christian. Not a single one, because that one drop would annihilate you for all of eternity. But Jesus drinks it to the very bottom of the cup. The cup is terrible, beyond imagination, but it was completely consumed by Christ in obedience to the Father. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? And again, for the Christians, your cup is empty. But if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, your cup is full and overflowing and waiting for you. It'll be a terrible day when you drink that cup of God's wrath. God says back in Jeremiah that the nations will be crazed. They'll go insane because they know the wrath that's coming. But there's really good news. And that good news is, is that if you will repent of your sins and believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, he will drain that cup for you. In fact, if you will repent, he did drain that cup for you on the cross. Jesus was incredibly courageous. He had power that we cannot fathom. He loved us with a love that we'll never have for anyone else and that we'll never feel from anyone else outside of him. And he obeyed to the point of death, even death on a cross. What do we do with this? Again, if you're not a Christian, the answer is to repent of your sins. The, the Father that gave this cup to Christ, He is perfect and He is righteous. He is the Creator God and He gave all of it to Jesus. The whole earth is, in, is, is His inheritance. And He said, worship Him. Worship the Son. Follow after Me. That's the call of God to every human that's ever lived. And yet we said no. And we choose to sin. But Jesus came. He lived a perfect life. And he drinks the cup of wrath on the cross so that you and I can have a relationship with Jesus Christ. We can get back to the Father. He gives us a new heart. And if you will repent of your sins and turn to him, believe that Jesus Christ is God, that he died, that he rose again three days later, and as today we celebrate that he ascended to the right hand of the Father, you will be saved. And the Lord puts reminders all around us. I'm not the only one that's declared to you your mortality. That death will come. You don't know how long you have. Death is coming. And the Lord puts all sorts of preachers in our life. Remember the beginning of COVID in 2020? When everyone was told millions and millions and millions are going to die? That's a preacher that reminds you of your mortality and what's to come. You had that close call in the car, a near miss. That's a preacher that reminds you of your mortality. You have friends that die. 
family members, loved ones that die. You hear the most recent mass shooting. You see a war in Ukraine. These are all preachers of our mortality. Repent of your sins and turn to God. For the Christian, worship the Savior. He gave himself for us. He drank the cup. He wasn't afraid. Men like Joe Gadara deserve our appreciation. It's right that we would be amazed by their acts of courage. But we should worship Jesus because no one has done what he has done. And finally, Christian, preach the gospel. Do you believe that God's cup of wrath is full and overflowing? People that you love are going to drink that cup if they don't repent. Preach the gospel. Tell people about Jesus, because the end is awful without him. I have family members that if they don't turn are going to spend a very, very long time in a very, very bad place. Preach the gospel because God's wrath is real and it's coming. And Jesus went to the cross knowing what would happen. He says in verse 4, then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward. He knew it all, every little bit, and yet he went anyway. Preach the gospel. Father, thank you for your son. Thank you that he had the courage to go to the cross on our behalf, to take your wrath when we are justly deserving of it. Father, there's nothing that I can do to gain heaven on my own. Without Christ, I'm lost and helpless. But I thank you, Father, that with Christ, we become more than conquerors through him who loved us. We hear great men speak great words, and yet the greatest man speaks, I am. We'd spend eternity trying to work out that statement. But we see the power of Christ come in his words. We see the power of Christ when he says, it is finished. And he hangs his head and dies on the cross and the wrath is spent and the punishment is done for all that would ever turn to you. Help us, Father, to be faithful in preaching the gospel. To be faithful in worshiping you rightly because of what, what you've done on the cross through your Son. And if there's any here today, Father, who don't know you, I pray that today would be the day that they repent and believe. That today would be the day when hearts might be changed. And their eternity would be the opposite of where they would, were headed. Thank you, Father, for Jesus. It's in his name we pray.